Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depends where you are in the world. So um, it's a great pleasure to have here today Professor Yano Corno from U University of Lyon. And uh, but today we are here for the talk by Professor Yano Corno. So thanks, Yan, again to accept uh, our invitation. So uh, Yano Corno is a professor for heterogeneous and non-electronic system design in the Depart Department of Electronics, Electrical and Control Engineering at Ecole Centrale de Lyon, France. He is currently head of the Heterogeneous System Design Group at the Lyon Institute of Nanotechnology and director of the SOC2 Research Network. Since 2008, he also holds a position of adjunct professor at Ecole Polytechnique de Montréal, Canada. His research interests include the novel computing and interconnect architecture based on emerging technologies associated with methods for design exploration. He has author or co-author well over 250 book chapters, journals, publications, conference papers, and patents. He has held various positions of responsibility in several national and European projects. He also serves as an expert with IFIP, International Federation for Information Processing, Working Group 10.5, that is related to design and engineering of electronic system. And he is vice president for initiative at the IEEE Council for Electronic Design Automation, CIDA. So, Jan, the floor is with you to start uh, your talk uh, about emerging technology based on 3D compute cubes for intelligence. So okay. Thank you again, and the floor is with you. Thank you, thank you, Ricardo, for your your kind words of introduction, and also for the invitation for me to have this opportunity to talk in this CAS uh, series. Uh, so I'm very pleased to be giving this talk uh, on emerging technology-based 3D compute cubes for edge intelligence, and it's actually a, a collaborative work which has come out of a European-funded uh, project. Uh, where we have six partners, Ecole Centrale de Lyon is, is one, obviously, but we also have EPFL, uh, NAMLAB, GTS, which is a, a small uh, company working on TCAD tools, LAS, CNRS in uh, Toulouse in France, and the University of Bordeaux, who is actually coordinating the whole project. So I'd just like to acknowledge their contributions to this, uh, this presentation as well. Now, I'd like to start with a, a motivational slide um, about edge intelligence. And I'm a big Star Wars fan. And I like to kind of situate uh, what we're trying to do in the context of a problem that uh, actually revealed itself during the very first Star Wars film, Star Wars, which is now called Episode 4. And so when I was a young boy, uh, there was this scene right at the very beginning of uh, this film where Han Solo meets an alien called Greedo in a cantina and who starts menacing him and they start to have a discussion. And the whole uh, exchange uh, happens with Han Solo talking in English and Greedo speaking in an alien language which we cannot understand, which is subtitled, but Han Solo can completely understand it uh, directly. So my questions at the time was, how is this working? I mean, is, is Han Solo... A, an incredible polylinguist or, or is there something else happening? And of course, uh, what we figured out in the end is that it's an in-ear translation device. And this actually exists. Uh, we, there, there are products today which exist and which may seem a little bit um, uh, futuristic, but they do actually exist. And you can actually uh, buy one of these things uh, to help you understand uh, real-time translation uh, as you go. And it works by um, having an earbud which communicates by Bluetooth to your mobile phone, and then that communicates to the cloud to some fairly heavy duty uh, large language models, which will then do the translation for you and get back with the translated result. Now, of course, um, you can see immediately that there are issues here because you have a latency uh, between the communication. So the interaction is not so fluid as it would be if you do actually have some very quick translation. The, the translation model uh, involves hundreds and mil of millions of parameters, uh, which are all at least of 32 bits. 
So it means you're doing many hundreds of millions of max uh, per inference with a 95% accuracy rate. So it's not always reliable. It is potentially slow. And it also consumes a large amount of energy. And we all know how much uh, energy is consumed in data centers. And it's something that you cannot uh, port directly into the, into the earbuds. So it needs a cloud. And this means that there are some uh, inherent issues uh, that are actually inherent to all edge intelligence uh, applications. There is latency. And so in this context, uh, could latency nullify hands lightning reflexes? And if anybody of you remember this actual scene, you remember that uh, it does not end well for Greedo, and it is basically because Han has these lightning reflexes. Um, could Jabber the Hutt, uh, Han's arch enemy, hack the communication, uh, which we're doing here to communicate to the cloud to find Han? So this is relating to security concerns uh, when you're doing this kind of application. And the, the last question is uh, basically, I mean, can you even do this? Is there even a signal on, on Tatooine? Because if we need the cloud, then we have to have a signal available. So this is a, a kind of introductory and motivation, a little bit of fun motivation to, to actually get to the actual core uh, issues surrounding edge intelligence. We have this issue that uh, we have very large general purpose artificial intelligence models essentially being used for either computer vision or for natural language processing, of which the previous slide was, was an example. And 100 million uh, parameters, in fact, general purpose AI models are actually 10,000 times larger. And the biggest or one of the largest monster uh, AI models that is implemented is Wudao 2.0, which has over a trillion uh, parameters. So it's, it's really a huge, huge model uh, which is implemented in a, in a large data center. And we're getting this exploding carbon footprint of data centers and data transport uh, energy is actually a large fraction of that carbon footprint. So having this communication between the edge and the cloud and doing it with such large um, data and actually executing these huge models in the data center means is, I mean, it's, this is one of the main problems that we're trying to solve when we talk about edge intelligence. And it's all about moving part of the intelligence or what is needed in terms of intelligence to the edge. So where can it, it can, is actually necessary when you actually want to do the computing. But of course, we all know that the inherent issues behind edge intelligence is that uh, doing executing models uh, at the edge is limited really to a, a very small number of parameters or very small compared to uh, what we were talking about earlier, 100 million or even a trillion parameters. Of course, you cannot do this uh, directly at the edge because you are limited by the amount of storage, which is constrained and the amount of computing uh, operations that you can also do, which is energy constraint. So you have these swap constraints, uh, space, weight and power constraints, which limit uh, the computing power and the storage uh, capacity that you could have at the at the edge itself. So this is the issue. Uh, so how can we do this real um, powerful uh, AI model at the edge without using uh, without using the, the cloud? So this is the uh, challenge that we're trying to address in the Full Monty project uh, that I was discussing earlier. So Horizon 2020 European funded uh, project. Uh, what we're basically trying to do is leverage uh, a number of innovations coming at multiple levels uh, from the technology, device, architecture or circuit, and then architecture um, uh, innovations. We're going from a very uh, novel kind of combination of devices uh, through the use of vertical transistors, also including non-volatile functionality through the use of ferroelectric um, layers, and also with the possibility of ambipolar functionality and therefore very fine-grained reconfigurability at the device level. So we're looking at a dedicated, generating a dedicated library of 3D logic cells, uh, which have a very high expressivity, expressivity and also include non-volatile functionality. And these logic cells we include into um, a building block that we're trying to build, a 3D building block, uh, to do um, neural network compute operations. So this is the actual core construct of the project, what we call the N2C2. We'll hear about this quite a lot, the neural network N2 compute cube C2. So this is uh, the building block that we want to put into place that we can then use for very um, data uh, intensive, 
hardware efficient uh, pieces for uh, neural network based architecture design. And so this we put into uh, this kind of um, cube here. So I have lots of the cubes which we put together in the X, Y and Z uh, dimensions which leads to very high physical regularity, which is always good for manufacturing concerns, but also functional versatility through the reconfigurability aspects and the non-volatility aspects as well. And this then can give us basically uh, means, hardware means, to do very efficient in-memory vector processing. So once we have this, and this is the aim of the project, is to go to very aggressive exploration of hardware, software, co-design, computing approximate computing techniques to do machine learning uh, algorithms so this is the overall kind of pitch for the project so what i'm going to be talking about here is the uh, i'm going to start with these three uh, technological flavors um vertical ferroelectric and ambipolar these very new and original uh, devices which we're we combining into a single uh, device to try to uh, see what happens uh, when we when we do this in a 3D architecture. So vertical, why do we use vertical? Why do we use ferroelectric? And why do we use ambipolar? And how can we put them all together? And so a very important aspect of this is uh, actually as with an emerging technology and with all emerging technologies, in fact, is that uh, we are working with an immature technology uh, which has not, be, has not had all the uh, technological investment and all the CAD investment as well. And so it's very important to be able to uh, explore the possibilities that the technology offers at the design level, but also at the system level and even at the application level. So I'll be talking a bit about the importance of design technology co-optimization and the template for DTCO that we've put up uh, in this in the framework of this project and what the issues are also uh, when we come to do this. And so this is really the link uh, between the design of well, the technology and the low level circuits let's say and the architecture that we're trying to look at so i'll describe then the n2c2 uh, compute cube how we use it in a systolic array architecture and how and what what this turns out to give when we try to apply this to a typical uh, language model uh, solver which is based on a transformer neural network okay so let's let's go um first question first technology the vertical technology why do we why why do we think that vertical technologies are, are really interesting well um we've all been following uh, the uh, irds the roadmap which is going towards increasingly small levels of uh, of gate length well gate length is um limited in scalar uh, sorry in in planar technologies by lithography resolution. And we've seen that there is stacking, which is possible uh, for nanosheet devices, uh, also with, with FinFET. But in the end, uh, we will always be limited by the lithography resolution for the uh, planar, uh, planar definition of these devices and their, their gate lengths. If we turn the channel by 90 degrees to make it into a vertical channel, then in essence, the gate becomes something which is defined through the thickness of a material rather than being defined by a lithography resolution. And the thickness of a material in a technology is actually much easier to control than the lithography. So we think that this will enable people to actually go then to even smaller lengths of, of gate in a device. It also has a, an additional added benefit in that you can do very straightforward stacking of multiple gate all around devices in series and i'll come back to this because it come it can be so of interest in certain logic cells to have multiple gates in series and in particular for large matrices uh, and for some logic uh, functions key logic functions we can get to a, a very interesting use of this kind of uh, kind of device so the message is that the vertical uh, which you can see as an example here this is an example picture from uh, from last one of our partners in, in, in Toulouse. Uh, so they've been doing gate all around vertical devices for a few years now. And you can see that this is basically the channel, which we see vertical here. And with a gate all around get, um, uh, material, which actually controls then the flow through the, through the gate. So scaling, the message is scaling continues. Uh, and if we can continue to scale, then we continue the benefits that we have been getting from Moore's law over the past 
decades with gate capacitance being reduced, device to device wiring capacitance reduced, and therefore better energy efficiency, uh, better, faster and less charge, which is being used in, in terms of devices. It is not a new idea. Vertical um, devices are not new, but uh, we're getting to a stage where interest is now renewed in this kind of uh, in this kind of device. And we see this in the IRDS in the uh, 2021 update on more more, uh, where we see this uh, evolution from the bulk then to SOI, uh, then to FinFET, uh, SOI FinFET, which is basically where we are now, uh, and then moving to gate all around devices which can be built, of course, in a lateral uh, configuration like the nanosheet uh, devices that have been uh, touted recently, but also in this vertical configuration. And so we think that, you know, in 2030, uh, there may be this kind of choice between uh, either lateral or vertical uh, kind of devices. And IBM has also been getting very interested in this and uh, uh, in the community in early, earlier this year, they came up with this uh, uh, this VT FET uh, structure, which is a vertical uh, FET, uh, basically saying that this is a next generation transistor to enable a trend of smaller, more powerful, and more energy efficient devices. So even they are talking about this uh, this possibility. Now, one of the first things that we uh, wanted to look at was uh, okay, if we have this um, if we have this kind of device, then what does it actually give us at the device level? When you start to build logic uh, cells, when you compare it to a FinFET, uh, FinFET device, and so what we did was do a very quick and, and not dirty, but a quick uh, analysis, analytical uh, model of uh, the energy delay product, which is a useful metric uh, to compare the speed of energy efficient circuits. So we built a, a geometric model for both uh, FinFETs and also for um, these vertical devices and compared basically the gain that we get in the energy delay product, the EDP, between FinFET and vertical nanowire FET uh, devices. So the overall structure, uh, overall analysis is, is, is here. And so you get lots of geometric parameters and the material parameters as well. And then if we look at what this actually gives us, it allows us to play around basically uh, to find out when would we get the best set of parameters uh, most promising parameters uh, to get to a, a significant increase in uh, in gain in terms of energy delay uh, product. So basically reducing the energy delay product of the of the vertical nanowire FET. And so what we were doing was playing around with uh, basically the, the channel length, uh, the what we get in terms of the EDP gain. And you can see here that we're already getting EDP gain of values of around 5, 10, up to 25 or so, even more in certain uh, configurations. And we were playing around this with, with, with length. And you see, obviously, that as you get to a smaller length, then the, the improvement gets better. We were also looking at what happens if we have a kind of empirical parameter like the gate level compactness, the nanowire radius, uh, the spacer length uh, in between the uh, source drain areas and the gate, and the gate uh, thickness uh, for uh, a given length. And this basically enables us to come to the following conclusion that you can get uh, very uh, strong uh, performance improvements for smaller devices and for fewer nanowires per uh, vertical nanowire FET. So this kind of bears out the idea that as you go to very small devices, uh, things will get better and better with, with round uh, and circular uh, nanowire structures rather than uh, these kind of very high FinFET, um, FinFET devices. Obviously, it's just an estimation. And so we continued this estimation um, in the physical design uh, area, the physical design domain, using STIX, uh, which is a, a quite an old tool uh, from, uh, from, the, from the 80s and 90s, but which actually gives you some uh, first level insights into how uh, you can get some uh, improved physical design and footprint when you're using this kind of um, this kind of structure, so this uh, vertical sticks uh, approach here, what we see is basically the multiple levels in in a sticks uh, diagram, uh, where you have blue as the metal uh, bottom level metal, purple as the top level metal, and then you have these circular devices, which are the P or N type nanowires uh, that connect vertically between the top and the bottom metal level. And you also have red in there somewhere, which indicates the the gate as well. And what we were doing, the, the aim of this uh, particular uh, exercise 
was to do um, expression of the cell area in units of F squared, where F is a minimum lithographic feature of the densest process layer, which here is the half pitch dimension of the metal one layer. So what we get uh, from this is uh, the observation that if you compare, um, uh, if you compare between a single gate level uh, device and a double gate level device, then you can get to more compact structures, which is what we expect, obviously with more uh, stacking than you get to better, uh, better footprints. But by how much, and this was the issue that we wanted to look at and for which particular functions. So we were looking at inverters, NORs, NANs, and XORs. And what we actually see is that uh, for, and as I expected, with XORs, um, you get the best uh, reduction in the uh, in the area, and it's basically almost 50% uh, that we're getting to. And this is actually what we almost were, were expecting because the XOR structure is an extremely interesting structure, in particular for uh, double gate or stacked gates, uh, stack gate devices, basically because the CMOS or static logic version of the XOR is basically only two stack transistors in, st in series. So this is where we're getting the maximum of the uh, of improvement in footprint. Okay, so this is the vertical aspect. Uh, second uh, flavor of technology is, is ferroelectric uh, technology, non-volatile memory technology, which we're also trying to combine into the, uh, into the, uh, the, the exploration. So ferroelectric is a non-volatile memory technology which has two flavors. It has a flavor of actually basically being a ferroelectric capacitance uh, where you have a ferroelectric oxide between two metallic layers. And you can use it as a capacitance, simply as a capacitance, which is what we call a ferroelectric RAM, where you'd have often 1T1C cells like DRAMs uh, where you can actually store uh, non-volatile data inside the capacitance, the polarization of the capacitance. But you also have another flavor, which is the FIFET, the ferroelectric field effect transistor, where basically what you're doing is attaching the ferroelectric capacitance to the gate contact of the transistor. And in this way, you are actually modulating the uh, threshold voltage of the transistor by uh, giving some permanent charge to the gate inside the ferroelectric uh, capacitance. It actually turns out that this kind of um, device and this kind of capacitor has best in class energy efficiency. For other non volatile uh, memory technologies, such as flash, MRAM, uh, PCM, phase change memory, or uh, resistive RAM, uh, you get much, much higher uh, write uh, power required per bit, write energy per, rather per bit. Here we're looking at 10 femtojoules per bit, uh, just FIRAM or FIFET. Whereas for others, your orders of magnitude greater, like 100 picojoules, 300 picojoules, 20 picojoules, or 200. So orders of magnitude better than other uh, non-volatile uh, memory technologies. It's also based on, and this was the, the key observation which led to CMOS-compatible ferroelectric. You may have heard of ferroelectric technologies based on perovskites and, uh, and PZT. Uh, this is an old technology, uh, and in 2011, a uh, discovery was made that uh, actually hafnium oxide can be made to be also ferroelectric. And hafnium oxide is a fantastic material because we already use it in CMOS processing. So it's inherently CMOS compatible. And it's also been proved to be compatible with vertical nanowire FETs. And this is a publication that came out also earlier this year uh, on uh, ferroelectric uh, vertical nanowire FETs. So you can use this to do build memory cells, of course, non-volatile memory cells, but you can also use it to do what we call non-volatile logic. And it's this shifting of the, um, of the threshold voltage, which is actually key uh, to getting to different functionalities inside logic cells. And I'll go into this in a little bit more detail in the following slides. And so it can then lead you to in-memory computing. In, in particular, if you have non-volatile logic gates, inherently you have memory and logic functionality inside a single gate. And this is really interesting to really fine grain in memory computing. The basic idea is that in ferroelectrics, uh, what you're trying to do is exploit this uh, hysteresis loop. And here what is being represented is the change in polarization of the uh, ferroelectric oxide with respect to a voltage which you apply across it. 
So if you apply a voltage, let's say of two or four volts, then basically you will follow this hysteresis curve up to switching the state of the polarization in a non-volatile way. And when you come back to zero, so when you switch it off basically, or you're not using it, uh, then it comes back to a positive state of, um, of polarization. So polarization positive, which leads to a low threshold voltage for an N-type or a high threshold voltage for a P-type uh, ferroelectric transistor. And then, then if you go to the other side, so you go to a very negative voltage, let's say minus four volts, this can be brought down, by the way, to let's say to minus two volts or so. Um, you can bring it. You can bring it down to switching the polarization of the ferroelectric oxide to the other uh, polarization state, negative polarization. And then when you come back to zero, then you have the other state, uh, which is here and which will be stored in a non-volatile way for, for for ages, unless you change it again. And here you have the opposite state, so high vol high threshold voltage for an n-type and low threshold voltage for a p-type. And so with this, you can then think about using this kind of device to input one piece of data uh, into the non-volatile uh, to get it to an, a high vol voltage, high threshold voltage or low threshold voltage. And then you input again on the gate the actual data that you then want to put in, the second piece of data, and you will get uh, a different response based on what you did uh, previously, either to a positive or negative polarization. So we were thinking then about well, what does this, does this give us uh, when we really bring this in to the memory array? Uh, can we do really um, logic operations inside the memory using this, this kind of this kind of approach? So this is what we call real in-memory uh, computing (IMC). Of course, you have other options which would be near-memory computing, where you would have some, uh, let's say, non-volatile. Uh, data uh, which is included in the memory, but then you have, let's say, a, a multiply accumulate um, uh, engine which is just next by to the memory. So you have no data transfer energy or latency which is involved with this. And you can also think about, and then you can compare to uh, how matrix multiplication, which is a typical operation that you're trying to do with, um, uh, with AI or any artificial intelligence application in neural networks. So matrix multiplication is a key operation that you're trying to do. And so you can do this with CPUs, with GPUs, with not near memory computing, with uh, in memory computing. And so what we tried to do was to do the kind of operation costs in terms of energy and latency. If you do uh, two to the power 10 multiplications, on two to the power n by two to the power n matrices with 32-bit uh, data representation. So really a back of an envelope computation on what happens if you uh, use these kind of four computation models and you involve the communication costs in terms of energy, uh, one picojoule per bit per, um, per uh, millimeter, 10 attajoules per bit in terms of computation inside the, the core, and 10 femtajoules per bit in terms of programming cost when you're using the non-volatile um, uh, non -volatile technology. And this is, so I put these numbers in and did some uh, back of the envelope computation. And this is what we get. So as you increase the uh, the size of the matrix, this is N here, uh, what you get is, uh, is uh, of course, you, we're expecting that you have some improvement uh, when you're uh, reducing the data transfer costs and then you're actually doing the, um, the computation within the, the logic. Uh, and inside the non-volatile logic. And we get to actually some extraordinary numbers when you have huge sizes of matrices. Uh, so if you have a, a N, which is the, a 10, uh, so you have uh, 1,024 by 1,024 matrices. Uh, this gives us uh, like almost uh, three orders of magnitude improvement in energy uh, when you're using in-memory computing. And it also gives us uh, 7x improvement in terms of, in terms of time. Uh, so this is really important. It really shows us uh, basically that if we do this, and if you do have this kind of thing, of course, there are learning things that we haven't taken into account. But this is the kind of the things that we can expect to achieve uh, with the with this kind of approach in, in memory and near memory computing. So what is uh, near, well, in memory computing using uh, non-volatile logic? Well, let me explain this in a key um, key logic operation that we want to do, the, the XOR. So XOR is really important. I said this earlier when we were talking about the discussion about the footprint using two, uh, two gate 
devices. Uh, XOR is a key operation for adders, as you know, it's at the, at the heart of the sum operation. Uh, so it's used in adders, it's therefore used in multipliers, and it's therefore used in multiply accumulate operations. So if you can input one of the coefficients, one of the pieces of data inside uh, a non-volatile XOR, and so let's say you have a coefficient, you know that the coefficient for the multiply accumulate operation is only going to change when you change the coefficient. So let's say once when you have to retrain the, the network or once when you're going to be using uh, it again. So really, you're really going to only be changing the coefficients once in a, in a very, um, very few times of uh, computation. So in convolutional filters and neural networks, this, this is going to be the case. So it makes sense to put this kind of uh, coefficients inside the um, the ferroelectric oxide, which would be here. So you're basically changing the state of this uh, this, uh, this this XOR gate. So um, if you do this, and I see in the chat that uh, we have uh, World Cup uh, matches, which are, <laughs> I think there is, a, there is, I guess, is there a World Match Cup going on? But okay. Uh, so I'll try to be a competitive and, and get to the end of this uh, quickly. Uh, so, so what you're trying to do is put... Uh, part of the data inside this XOR uh, gate here. So in an XOR structure, you have uh, two uh, transistors in series. But here, as you have uh, one of the pieces of data which you're programming directly into the uh, ferroelectric oxide, you actually only have one transistor. And this non-volatile coefficient is stored once and for all inside the ferroelectric oxide. And then you bring in B and B bar into uh, the, uh, the logic gate, and you process this uh, B at speed. Okay, that's a relief. England versus USA is later. Okay, so what happens here is that basically what you're doing is, is you're changing the state of the, one of these uh, transistors to either switch it off all the time or make it actually switch based on, based on B. So if you have A or A bar and you know this, you can program it in and this will change then the status of the um, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the of the transistor. So this is a work that has been published uh, a few years ago now uh, by our colleagues in NAMLAB. And the structure of this uh, logic gate was basically using just an, an N-type uh, ferroelectric transistor with a pull-down branch based on the transistors, but a pull-up resistive load just to demonstrate basically the, uh, the functionality. So this is what they got, and it, it does actually work. Now, you can, if you think about this, then you can use the same structure here and then uh, bring in a p-type pull-up uh, structure based on the same kind of thing. And so this gives you a non-volatile XOR gate, uh, which is based on four, non uh, four non-volatile ferroelectric transistors. And if you then go to a, a three-input XOR gate, which could be of increasing interest also for the sum uh, function, because this is basically the sum function here, uh, you get to eight devices instead of 20. And what is interesting also, if we look at this uh, very carefully, is that four of these transistors actually could share the same, uh, the same ferroelectric oxide. Uh, indeed, uh, th this sharing could make things easier if you have then a separate uh, ferroelectric capacitor somewhere else, let's say on back end of line, and then you have the... Uh, front end of line transistors, which then use the same uh, same capacitance. So this could be really interesting because you only then would have two separate capacitances that you can then use for one side of the logic gate and for the other side uh, here. So A and store A and A bar. Okay, so that was the second technological flavor that we were looking at. And the third technological flavor is ambipolar. And this is functionality enhanced um, transistors. So the idea here is, uh, and this is not a new idea either, uh, we worked uh, with people at EPFL uh, who are now at the University of Utah uh, on this kind of idea about having a very, um, uh, let's say, very flexible fabric of devices that you can then use to configure to various functionalities uh, here. And basic, the basic idea is that we're looking at reconfigurable transistors, and rather than having fixed um, chemical doping of the devices through the use of N-type or P-type dopant atoms, you actually have um, ambipolarity when you have Schottky barriers at the uh, drain and source contact, 
uh, which enables you to use electrostatic doping. And therefore, you can use a polarity gate uh, to change the type of carrier inside the channel. If you use uh, a polarity gate which is set to uh, a positive voltage, then you get to an n-type. You're uh, allowing n-type electrons to go into the channel. And if you set it to uh, a zero or negative uh, voltage, then you achieve uh, p-type uh, carriers, the holes which are being allowed to enter into the channel. So this really gives you ultimate logic flexibility. And this was then put into practice in a uh, work that was done about 10 years ago or so uh, on a, a dumbbell uh, approach where you have this very, very flexible uh, motif of circuits, which enables you to get to a large number of logic functions uh, from, just by uh, connecting uh, these different logic nodes, N1, N2, N3, 4, 5, and 6, and the various gates together. And you basically uh, connect this to supply voltages, ground or VDD, or to input or output, and it will give you uh, a different logic uh, logic status, logic function. So what we were doing here is trying to figure out what, what happens then if we then look at this same structure, but we're now we're looking at vertical uh, transistors. And we actually get to uh, an extremely compact uh, structure where, you have, where we've mapped all the nodes N1 to N6 and the, the gate one, gate two. Uh, and this tile uh, basically gives the possibility to achieve very uh, compact structures, but also very flexible structure. And so here, if we compare what we get in terms of an XOR, which again is our kind of benchmark uh, circuit that we're looking at, a two input XOR will give us a 2.5X uh, foot pin reduction here, uh, where we have, I think, a very small uh, structure with respect to what we saw earlier, the uh, single gate and double gate uh, structure. So extremely interesting uh, ways of looking at this kind of thing. Now, so those are the three technologies uh, that we were looking at. Uh, and now uh, emerging technology means that uh, we are really trying also to kind of project things up to the circuit, then the uh, architecture, and then the application level. So um, how do we do this? How do we go about actually doing some design technology co-optimization where you have a device which has not yet been optimized? And if you use the same kind of techniques for optimization, uh, at the device level, you may not get to the best uh, solution at the circuit level or the architecture level or, or even further. So this uh, co-optimization loop means that actually what we want to do is to uh, join optimization at device level and circuit level and then at the architectural level. So if we look, at, if we look here, then what we have to do is actually figure out what are the handoff points between the device uh, and the circuit, and then the circuit and the uh, and the architecture. And so it turns out that the handoff point should be the executable device model for which enables circuit simulation between devices and circuits. So if we have an executable device model, we can actually then explore how different physical parameters and geometrical parameters can influence the, the um, device performance, such as its on and off current, its threshold voltage and things like that. And you can already do this kind of exploration at the device level. But when we get to the circuit level, then things may become a little bit more complicated. So what we need at the circuit level is also, again, uh, the capability of being able to uh, change the circuit level parameters, such as the number of nanowires per device, such as the design style, the logic style that we're using and the function, function that we're trying to achieve. And then we can do this kind of evaluation, uh, extracting the energy delay product, the footprint, and doing this at, at a much more detailed level than what we were doing previously with just an analytical model. We're actually using the uh, simulation and the executable device model and using simulation to extract the, the, uh, the, the values. Now, this is one side of the uh, uh, extraction. Uh, but what we also need is the physical view as well. So the physical view means that we have to have some way or some means of representing the 3D layout of the of the circuit that we're actually designing. And this is actually um, uh, quite a, a difficult task, and I'll explain how we went about this uh, also. But it's necessary because we need to have this view. We need to be able also to extract parasitics and do a more reasonable circuit schematic simulation uh, to extract the actual values of uh, the EDP and the footprint, et cetera. And for this, we need the compact model and also, to some extent, T 
TCAD to do this ex extraction of the parasitic uh, values. And when we have this, then we can also do some optimization at this level to optimize at uh, the circuit level. But what we really also want to do is be able to go back to the device with this information and say, okay, what would be really good is to figure out how we can improve the on current and maybe we can uh, tolerate some degradation in the threshold voltage, uh, for example. And this also needs here device simulation, device architectures to be uh, explored, again with parasitic exploration. So again, uh, 3D uh, view, and this would really use uh, TCAP. And this is not the end, because uh, we also have to then go up to an architecture, and the handoff point between circuit and uh, architecture turns out that it's actually a standard cell library. Uh, so we've been talking about these four uh, logic functions that we wanted, the, the inverter, nor, NAND, and the XOR to input uh, logic. Uh, of course, we can also go to more inputs as well. This actually is another branch that we'll be exploring, but I won't go into that in, in any more detail here. But the idea is that uh, if we want to actually synthesize a complex block like the N2C2, uh, then we do actually need a standard cell library to then synthesize and then uh, actually put together again with some ideas about the routing strategy and then do that evaluation. And then in a perfect world, we can also loop back to the device and even back to this, uh, sorry, to the circuit and then even back to the device level to actually uh, identify what we should change or what we could change to improve things uh, at either of these levels. So this means that we do need uh, physical design tools. Uh, and so uh, what we did uh, was uh, try to accelerate the, the design of these kind of uh, circuit schematics. And to do this, what we did was do a scripted 3D cell generation, which looks kind of like this. So it's actually quite easy to, to, to set up and then to generate, let's say, semi-automatically the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the circuits a lot quicker than if we try to do this uh, by hand. And then we can do a GDS2 file export, import it into a TCAD tool, and do the parasitic extraction. And this tool flow has been set up, and we can also do a TCAD simulation and compare it with, uh, with, uh, with the simulation results at the circuit level. So this was important. Uh, the flow has been set up, and we're currently going through this kind of um, ad addition to the standard cell library characterization that we're going doing at the moment. This is the kind of 3D views that we can generate. So in addition to it actually being useful to extract uh, uh, parasitics, it also uh, gives us a good idea about what cells actually look like. Here you can see the, the vertical nanowires, uh, N-type and P-type, uh, the connections that we have. And you can see here that we are actually also uh, thinking about using 45 degrees octolinear um, uh, routing, uh, both at top and bottom level, rather than just Manhattan routing. Uh, we think this is also of some interest to, to look at this. And this is for XORs uh, that we have here, with junction for one layer uh, transistor and two layer transistor. And we can see here this reduction in footprint that we were kind of expecting and predicting from the sticks, uh, sticks diagrams. Uh, we have other three input XORs, uh, the ambipolar tile as well, uh, and this is what happens then when we go to more uh, complex structures like a full adder and when we try to use this kind of octolinear uh, routing style. And this is the improvement that we get when we go from Manhattan uh, routing to octolinear. As expected, we do get uh, more compact structures, but by how much? And this was the, the quantifying, this was the, uh, the important part. And this shows that we can get up to almost 3x reduction in footprint just by using uh, this kind of octolinear uh, routing approach. Now, one of the open issues that we do have is, uh, as I was saying previously, uh, and so uh, this is kind of an open call for people who would be interested in logic synthesis and techniques uh, that, that, that we have, uh, that we want to explore here. Um, the, our, our basic problem is that uh, we are looking at non-volatile logic, which means that we just have a single um, physical input. Technically, it is a double input, but it's sequential. Uh, we're using different uh, logic voltages uh, to input a piece of non-volatile data. We're using like the plus or minus two volts, let's say, to input a non-volatile piece of data. And then on the same gate, uh, we're also inputting another piece of data, which is the volatile uh, input. And so uh, it's, a, it's a very strange uh, way of thinking uh, that we have a sequential input of two pieces of data using different logic levels coming in at se separate times, 
And so our question is, uh, how do we actually synthesize logic gates using this kind of uh, this kind of approach? We do have a kind of workaround structure that we could probably think about, but uh, actually fundamentally, how should we actually go about doing this using standard uh, logic synthesis uh, tools and things like this? So we're actually starting to think about this and, and trying to work on this. And we're open to collaboration. And if people have ideas or would like to uh, interact or collaborate as well, then we'd be very happy to, to, to talk about this as well. Okay, and this is the synthesis flow. Now, just maybe uh, in the interest of time, uh, maybe wrap up with a few words on, on the actual N2C2, the neural network compute cube. I've talked a lot about the, uh, about the uh, technology itself, but of course, this is not uh, the end. And so we want to go to the neural network compute cube as well. And so the N2C2 is actually a, a very flexible computing hardware block for transformer-based neural networks. This is what we want to do. And so what we wanted to do was include a lot of configurability inside this, uh, inside this cube. And so the schematic looks a little bit like this. The actual physical uh, fabric that we use, as you've probably understood, that there are many possibilities and variants which are open to us. And we're currently starting to do the synthesis uh, onto, these, onto these fabrics. So uh, the, what we wanted in terms of configuration is to uh, be able to configure the function. Uh, so we started from a kind of 32-bit hypothesis um, and looking at 32-bit integers, integer data, uh, doing multiply accumulate or just the multiplication or just the addition uh, with or without an activation function uh, that we can also include. Uh, we also wanted it to be uh, connectivity configurable to be able to, to build multiple layers, uh, so two to eight operations uh, are possible. Also data width configurable, uh, to be able to scale up to, uh, to let's say, two times 32, so 64-bit or 128 or 256-bit data, uh, but also scaling down within the individual N2C2 uh, to go down to two times 16-bit operations or four times 8-bit operation, eight times 4-bit operations, thing, things like this. And so we have a lot of configuration possibilities inside this kind of uh, this, this cube. And obviously, as you can see also, um, uh, truncation, shift left, shift right, uh, this kind of thing to handle the, uh, the difficulties uh, when we're actually moving to various representations of data. It's a, basically the idea is to put it into a systolic array. Now, a systolic array, again, it's not new. It's a, basically a homo homogeneous network of very tightly coupled hardwired data processing units. So here, the data processing unit, unit the DPU, would be the N2C2. Yeah, as uh, many of you will know, it's a very uh, well adapted to very dense linear algebra computations, such as uh, 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 neural network computation or uh, convolutional filter computation. And basically, from the point of view of a single N2C2, it will independently compute a partial result uh, from data received from Upstein neighbors. Uh, it stores the result within itself and then passes the result as well uh, downstream. So what we did uh, was basically say that uh, B would be shared across uh, rows, A across columns. And then we have to decide when to put various pieces of data. And as you can see, this diagonal uh, kind of approach uh, reflects uh, the synchronization issues that uh, we have when we start putting things in together. Obviously, A00 and B00 come together the first. They pass a, re a result to uh, pieces of uh, N2C2, which are further downstream, which will then receive B01, uh, for example, and the result. Uh, so, so things like this. So we designed the cell in such a way as to be able to easily add further features like uh, various uh, functionalities. Uh, but uh, this is an example of how things would work. And this is an example of what we see in terms of uh, shifting pieces of data and computations uh, alongside during the matrix multiplication. Uh, so here we have uh, a number of iterations which we need to resolve all rows. Uh, so this is what will happen. And the latency can be computed as well here. And this is basically what we then chose to actually uh, do the hardware design of this systolic array, do a very scalable digital model uh, for a simple uh, implementation, 
it's the B matrix that we put into the uh, non-volatile coefficients, which can be non-volatile, can also be uh, um, volatile, and we can also have like non-volatile, sorry, uh, um, memory elements inside the N2C2. This is something we're also exploring. Uh, and then we have streaming of A matrix elements to do the computation at speed inside the N2C2s and then inside the matrix. And this is the result of a functional simulation uh, without the actual computation and use of the synthesized uh, results. This is something we did earlier. Uh, so functionally, this, this works, and this is what we see uh, here. Uh, we have to handle the overflow. So it's a saturation-based overflow management policy to avoid uh, any issues inside the, uh, the, the matrix. And so then we go higher. So it's a weight stationary systolic array, basically. Uh, and this was then mapped to our colleagues' uh, tools at uh, EPFL, who then did um, uh, mapping of an accelerator based on this kind of N2C2 uh, into their GEM5X uh, system simulation. They added some instructions to load the weights uh, into the N2C2 in a non-volatile thing. And then they do the streaming of the input to get the output. And this uh, they did and applied to a transformer structure in matrix matrix multiplication. And this is what uh, actually came out uh, when they were doing some explorations of, of this. Based to a conventional architecture without acceleration, uh, we can get to uh, a 10x speed up, basically, and also a strong, very strong use in, um, in of data. So this reduces the, the memory accesses, and this is kind of what we were showing previously in the exploration of uh, in-memory computing versus GPU and CPU implementations. And so we, this is a very strong motivation also for going to this kind of uh, this kind of structure. So in conclusion, I'll wrap up here. Um, what I hope to have uh, been able to show you in this uh, in this talk is that uh, we very strongly believe in the promise of emerging technologies, and we've been using three of these three flavors of emerging technology and trying to combine it in a single um, a single exploration. So we used the vertical transistors and showed that, that you can get to a 10x CDP reduction with respect to a uh, 7 nanometer FinFET um, in some uh, configurations and for also for a 40 nanometer vertical nanowire gate length. Um, we also use ferroelectric in memory computing, uh, which gives both 10x energy and 10x latency reductions with respect to a CPU based approach for very high levels of a matrix multiplication. And the ambipolar approach gives us access to very compact, flexible, and disruptive uh, logic cells. And the N2C2 approach, which I just uh, finished up by presenting, gives us also a 10x uh, reduction in inference time with respect to a conventional approach. So we hope that this uh, can then give us a new hope. So this is looping back to the initial motivational slide at the beginning and also to the 10K uh, improvement that we were trying to get in terms of energy efficiency. If you do all the 10 by 10 by 10 by 10, uh, this uh, could give us an improvement of 10K. And so this is our target for the, uh, uh, to, to prove this by the end of the project in a couple of years' time. Thank you very much for uh, listening to, uh, to what I have to say. And I've seen that there, is, uh, there are a few questions in the chat, so I'm looking forward to having a discussion with you now and, uh, and engaging with you and talking about this uh, very exciting technology. So, Ricardo, should I? Yes. Uh, so thank you very much for the very nice uh, talk. With pleasure. So um, about the questions. So the first one is by Rodrigo hmm. Werdig. Mm -hmm. So uh, is it possible to use a different thickness on the ferroelectric layers in a similar way as in multi-VT synthesis? OK. Um... Actually, the thickness of the ferroelectric layers is probably the not, not, not the right way to think about it. Um, the, um, if you work on the thickness, uh, what you're basically doing is you will be working on the um, level of voltage that you need to program the, uh, program the ferroelectric layer. So if you increase the, uh, the thickness, then basically the, uh, the, the voltage will, will, will increase. Um, now... The question is actually interesting because if you do think about having a multi uh, VT or multiple levels of, uh, of polarization, you can actually achieve this. Uh, and you because and the reason why 
is because inside the ferroelectric layer, you have multiple grains of ferroelectric uh, oxide. And it's actually these individual grains which are switching uh, to get to the, the various levels of polarization. So if the question is more about can you get to a multiple um, multi-level memorization cell, the answer is yes. Uh, and the way that people do this today is that they apply um, to relatively large uh, capacitors, relatively large, let's say, in dimensions and planar dimensions, relatively large, um, uh, yeah, relatively large capacitors. They apply successive uh, voltages, and by applying various pulses, you'll uh, get various grains which change from time to time. Uh, so stochastically, you will get um, a change. Uh, an almost analog, a quasi-analog uh, change in the in the threshold voltage of your transistor. So uh, I think this uh, is maybe what you were thinking about, multiple levels of, of threshold voltage. So the answer is yes, you can do it. Not through the thickness, but maybe uh, better in the, the type of size of the, um, of, the, of the capacitor and using pulses to, to then program it individual grains. There is a complement of the question by Rodrigo. Yeah. So yeah. using a lower VT on the circuit's critical path and higher VT on the other parts to reduce leakage, mm -hmm. is it double from a manufacturing perspective? I think you already answered this. Okay, yeah, I mean, again, um, the, the, the idea would then be to, to program one uh, to a low VT uh, to, yes, as, as you're saying, to have a high-speed transistors and then to a higher VT to have a low leakage transistor. Yes, this is, this is possible. I mean, from, from a manufacturing perspective, I mean, it doesn't really have any, well, of course it has an impact on the manufacturing, but it would be mainly on the programming uh, that you do then uh, afterwards. Um, maybe one other thing um, that I could add to that discussion is that a few years ago, uh, people were getting excited about what they call negative capacitance uh, ferroelectric oxides. Um, so extremely thin um, uh, ferroelectric oxide, oxides, which actually... Um, represent in this uh, this hysteresis curve that I showed you, uh, polarization versus uh, voltage. If you uh, go to a very thin oxide and you suppress the hysteresis, you get um, a kind of magic area where you're going from one side to another side, but through a kind of negative capacitance uh, area where you have a negative derivative of polarization versus voltage. So this is this people are getting quite excited about this because it means if you have a negative capacitance, then you can actually artificially lower the um, the, the threshold voltage of a transistor. Uh, from the external point of view, you have a very extremely low uh, threshold voltage and an extremely high slope. So people are getting very excited about this, but uh, experimentally, it's that proved to be actually quite difficult to do. Uh, so this is maybe something which will come back in, in the future, but at the moment, uh, this is still, it still remains kind of um, futuristic, let's say. Thank you. So now a question by Rafael Cardoso. Hi, Rafael. Pleased to see you here. <laughs> So Rafaela is, is one of my PhD students, not working on, on this topic, but, uh, uh, but he's working with people who are. Uh, so the, on the fabrication of nanowire transistors, yeah. So there, there are two, um, I assume that you're talking about the vertical uh, nanowire transistors. So the, uh, the, the, the labs that are working on this, in particular LAS in Toulouse and NAMLAB in, uh, in Dresden, uh, they have at the moment uh, achieved uh, experimental devices which have a radius of 22 nanometers, a, um, a length of 14 uh, nanometers uh, gate length. So this is the vertical uh, layer, right? And the density uh, still has to be explored uh, because indeed, uh, when you're looking at separate devices, uh, then you would be looking at uh, separating them quite, quite, quite a lot. Uh, but uh, you can also put individual uh, wires inside a single transistor, and then you can get to extremely dense um, dense implementations of a transistor, like a, a pitch between uh, nanowires of a, a couple of nanometers. So it really can be very, very dense inside a single single device. Uh, so, so that's kind of the state of the fabrication uh, as it stands. Um, what people are thinking about and are trying to explore inside the consortium from the, the TCAD point of view is what is the actual uh, limits of fabrication that we could actually reasonably achieve if we had 
the same level of investment uh, as is going into, let's say, the, uh, the, the some, some of the Oregon or Arizona fabs from TSMC, uh, tens of billions of dollars which to, to develop the technology and so if we had that kind of dream uh, situation or scenario uh, what where could we get to in terms of density so this is indeed something that we, we want to look at i think there will be um a limit a physical limit to how uh, how small we can get the, uh, the 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 gate length because at some point of course we're not going to be able to control uh, much in terms of uh, channel uh, ch channel state or on on current or off current, uh, so at some point we will be limited in terms of the actual gate length that we can achieve. I think that the radius of the uh, the nanowire can become extremely small, like a couple of nanometers as well. Um, gate length, I'm a little bit uh, less less sure about how how small we can go to, but density of integration, I think we can get to extremely extremely dense uh, dense transistors. Thanks, Rafael, for the question. Thank you. So I see no more questions in the chat, but uh, for sure I have one. <laughs> okay. So I think I'm about to buy slides uh, 23, 24. You show the the proposal of new gates. And uh, okay. if you are moving, I can also move here. Is it this one? Uh, no, the other one more. Cool. Yes. Uh, so uh, this one how you can uh, the, the the claim of about uh, 10 times less energy to run is also related to these gates hmm. okay um so when i was talking about 10 times less energy it was mainly uh in the vertical uh, nanowire transistor uh, so so yes uh, it is basically uh, related to this it is uh, also further uh, enhanced by the fact that here we're looking at non-volatile logic. So if we have non-volatile logic, then we would put this in the in-memory computing, very fine-grained in-memory computing, in which we also get uh, significant uh, improvements at the architecture level uh, from uh, for, in terms of energy and also in terms of uh, latency. So, so yes, uh, here, uh, this is where we get the 10x at the gate level and also 10x at the architectural level. Yeah, this is also related to the systolic arrays you mm. talk about. Yeah. Okay. So the systolic arrays, uh, which were here, so this is a different uh, architectural model than the one which, which was used for the uh, comparison between IMC, NMC, GPUs, and CPUs. Uh, but in in fact, it, it still bears out the uh, the initial observations in, in the form of this uh, 10x speed up and reduction in in data uh, memory accesses. Uh, so if we have fewer memory accesses, then of course we will have less energy consumption to move the data around. So, so this is uh, what we're looking at in terms of uh, the reduction in energy uh, due to reduction in memory access. Don't know if this, this answers the question or? Yes, uh, okay, thank you very much. So just uh, a comment to the audience that uh, maybe some ones are, uh, Youngers don't know uh, in the traditional book of introduction to VLSI system by Carver, Mead, and Lynn Conway. Mm -hmm. There is a nice chapter explaining about uh, systolic arrays. Now, if someone wants to read yeah. a little bit more about what is systolic arrays, can exactly yes. an address to this chapter. No, exactly yes, and uh, just uh, maybe as, in, in terms of uh, culture, systolic comes from. The heart, right? And uh, yeah. the, the idea is indeed that in systolic arrays like this one, uh, you have this um, flow of, of data and computation that kind of goes, propagates across like every heartbeat, kind of moves yeah. all the data around. So, so that's it into a matrix of small processors. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. So thank you very much, Ian. Oh, great pleasure. Very, it was very happy. Great to talk to as always. And uh, I hope to see you in person soon. Me too. And, uh, <laughs> so uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you again, uh, Yam. And uh, oh, thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, so I'm closing the, the session now with... Uh,